I'd like to welcome you all and uh, this is your brother Osama Iqbal and inshallah I will be moderating this um, session titled The Struggle Within. Um, so here I will introduce inshallah our first speaker for this session, Ustad Aisha Prime. Uh, Ustad Aisha converted to Islam more than 20 years ago. Uh, after being and serving as a, uh, a youth ambassador to Morocco and Senegal. Uh, there she studied Aqidah, Quran, Hadith, Arabic, uh, jurisprudence, Fiqh, Islamic law, purification of the heart, and other religious-related uh, learning. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, may Allah you will accept it uh, from her and bless her and increase in her uh, knowledge and actions. Uh, she has received sev several scholarly ijazat. Uh, and uh, Ustada Aisha Prime is a proud wife and a mother of three uh, children. Uh, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. With that, I will pass the floor uh, to uh, Ustada Aisha, who is, inshallah, going to deliver a talk on measure yourself before being measured. Zakallah khair. Jazakumullah ar khair. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful event. Alhamdulillah, just so proud of all the efforts that we're doing to keep us firm upon, the, upon Surat al Mustaqim during these days. You know, there is a story that we're all familiar with, a, fair, a famous narration of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, is sitting in a halaqa with his companions. And Umar ibn al-Khattab is sitting with him in the one who narrates this particular story. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, says to his companions, the next man who walks through this door is a man of Jannah. And so, of course, all the eyes of the companions are looking at the door, wondering who is it that's going to walk through this door? It must be a, a magnificent man. There must be a light that's shining from his face. They're going to be able to just witness it. And the man who walks through the door next is just an ordinary man. There's nothing seemingly overly you know, exciting about him, nothing remarkable in his appearance. He comes, he gives salams, he prays, and then he begins to leave. Omar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, is so curious to know how come the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, says this is a man of Jannah. So he runs after him and he asks the man, he says, uh, I have a problem going on in my home. Is it possible that I would be able to spend a, a few nights with you? And so this man, you know, just mashallah, being a good Muslim brother, says, sure, ya Omar. So Omar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, begins to spend the next couple of nights in the home of this man. And he's watching him very closely. He's looking to see, you know, what is it that he does special? There must be some private ibadah that he's doing, right? He's looking for, is he standing in the night? Is he getting up or every, is he fasting every day? He's getting up for suhoor. What is it that makes this man a man of Jannah? And so after a few days pass, and subhanAllah, Omar just doesn't notice anything remarkable about him. And on the third day, the man comes as his tradition that he's given him the full three days, right? The rights of a guest. And he just gently says to Omar, Omar, how are things in your home? How are things with your family? And Omar, understanding the nature of his question, responds to him and says, you know, I have to admit, there's actually no problem going on in my home. I simply wanted to spend some time with you. And I wanted to spend some time with you because the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said, you are a man of Jannah. You are, you are Ahl of Jannah. And I wanted to know what was it about you that was Ahl of Jannah. But to be honest, I didn't find any of the things that I was looking for. And so of course the man, he stood back astonished. He said, the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said, I am a person of Jannah, that I am, that I am a man of Jannah, right? He's so excited. But then he says to Omar, Ya Omar, you're right. I can't find anything about myself that the Prophet that would say that I was a person of Jannah. He, he says, you know, I don't pray. I don't get up and pray. I'm not a person to fast very often. He began to contemplate himself and he said, Ya Omar, you're right. I, I don't have many good deeds that would make me a person of Jannah. He said, except there's one thing that I do. There's only one thing I can think of. And Umar ibn Khattab, of course, he leads in as his curiosity raises and he's wondering, what is it? Tell me, what is it, that thing? And he said, well, in, at the end of every day, before I'm about to go to sleep, I sit and I take an account of my day. 
I look through uh, my conversations, the people that I spoke with, who I engage with, and I ask myself, did anything happen that I need to atone for? Did I say anything that I need to rectify? Is there anyone that harmed me that I need, uh, that I should want remove any ill sentiment in my heart for them? And before I go to sleep, I make sure that I remove any ill sentiment in my heart for anyone before sleeping. And Umar ibn Khattab, رضي الله تعالى عنه, he immediately raises up and he said, this is it. This is it. This is why you're Ahlul Jannah. There are two things about this narration that are so, in, that are so impertinent for us to understand. That are so pertinent for us to be able to grasp and to implement into our lives. The first one is a level of responsibility. That Omar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, when he heard that this person was a person of Jannah, he immediately said, I have the responsibility to find out what are the qualities that this man possesses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would enter him into his Jannah. Why is he looking for that? He's saying, because I too am looking for Jannah. I too want to please my Lord. I too have made the shahada, right? I too have said that I bear witness. There is none worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And my goal in life is to make it into Jannah. So I have the responsibility to find out what are those qualities. And when I find them out, to then implement them myself. And the next one is an even higher quality. And that's the quality of the man. What he practices is a very high Islamic concept called muhasibah. That and the, every night he takes himself to account. He begins to look at what are the deeds and the actions and the speech of my day. That then I'd be able to say, okay, what was the value of my interactions? And do and once even, even if I find that there's something that harmed me, not just what I have to do, but if there's something that has harmed me, that I have the responsibility to remove it from my heart. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ said that we should never have ill sentiment, a contempt for the believer. That we, the Muslims, should never have hatred for the believer. And so he, this man, understands, subhanAllah, that he has to clear his heart. This is the meaning of the ayah. لا يؤاخذكم الله بلغو في عمانكم ولكن يؤاخذكم بما كسبت قلوبكم Allah will not take you to task for idleness in your oaths but he will take you to task for whatever your hearts have earned what this man understands is the condition of my heart is going to affect everything that I'm connected to it's going to reflect it's going to be in reflected in my speech it's going to be reflected in my actions. It's going to be reflected in my, in my interaction with people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold me account for that. That I'm going to have to answer to Allah, not only for my speech, right? Not only for my actions, but that which is inside of my heart. And so understanding that, what he knows is that being accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mean that if I don't have to be accountable to anyone else. See, the ego will tell us, I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to give an account to anybody. But the one who knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in this dunya with other people so that we would know the reality of our own selves, so that we would be able to place a value on our sincerity, so that we would be able to ask ourselves, what am I sincere about in my actions? That first we have, we recognize I have a responsibility in my loyalty to Allah to have good character, to have good speech, to have good interactions, to have good relations with people. Not only because of the people themselves, not based upon what they do or they don't do, not based upon what they say or they don't say, but because I am going to be held accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because of that, because I've taken that responsibility on myself, then I have got to mold and shape my character. I've got to make sure that my heart is clean, that my heart is pure. And the main thing in order to do that, 
the biggest enemy to muhasiba, the biggest enemy to holding ourselves to account is the ego. As we know, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, told us that the ego is worse than 70 devils. Right? He's told us that the enemy of the ego is standing in our way. He's waiting in order to call, call us into a, a lack of accountability. That I don't have to be the one who is responsible. And so subhanAllah, we're told that wage war against your ego. Fight against the one who doesn't want you to be accountable. Be that person that points the finger. When somebody points it at you, right, you poke holes in them. When someone says, listen, you didn't do that properly. Listen, you were cheating in your business. Or, you know, you were rude in your speech. Or you, you overreacted. Or your anger is, is, you know, harmful to the people. You should be more kind or more gentle. You have to increase in knowledge. The person then says, who are you? I know your sins, right? You're doing this, you're doing that. You're calling me to account? That's what the ego will tell us. But what happens in that situation is that we keep ourselves from mental growth, spiritual growth. We keep ourselves from, from moving forward on Sarat al-Mustaqeem. That Sarat al-Mustaqeem is a path that we walk on, not a path we sit on, waiting for its blessings to come with us, saying, I'm on this path. I'm sitting on the path. You see me on the path. No, it's a path that we walk every day, decision by decision, interaction by interaction, relationship by relationship. And through these interactions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us how are we going to be in our relationship with Allah based upon how we are with other people. We have the responsibility to seek knowledge. We have the responsibility to not only seek religious knowledge in terms of the law, but we have the responsibility to seek the kind of knowledge to better our character. It's not, we're not going to be able to cry in front of Allah on the day of judgment and say, you know, I was ignorant of the law. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. That we have the responsibility to seek knowledge. That seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. In, in not just in religious matters, if I'm going to engage in business so that I know that I practice fair trade, so that I know that I am just in my dealings, I've got to know the laws of dealing with that. If I'm going to get married, I need to know the rights and regulations, not, not just of the ones I want to receive, but the ones that I am responsible for giving. Why? Because I want to be accountable to Allah and I want to be accountable to the people that I love. I want to be accountable to the people in my life to say how, if I have done something wrong, tell me so that I can atone, so that I can be better. It's like Omar ibn Khattab, not only in this narration, in another narration, he goes to Hudayfa, Ya Hudayfa, you know the hypocrites, am I one of them? Hey, why? He wants to know, tell me, so that I can bring myself to account. I want us just to recognize that subhanAllah, there are lots of excuses that the ego will give us. I'm only human. I'm not like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I make mistakes, we all make mistakes. There's a difference between the kind of soul that allows it to run away, to allow the, that allows the nafs to just run amok. There's the type of soul that tightens, the, that tightens the human being, that tightens the self so much that one falls into despair. I never do anything right. I'm always, I'm always a horrible person. I'm, you know, it, it, it doesn't uh, also allow the soul to grow. And there's the kind that says, I'm gaining insight. I recognize my wrongs and I'm recognizing my wrongs in order to be better. And so in this muhasibah, it's something that we should practice on a regular basis. If not once a month, if not once a year, then once a month, once a week. Or be like this man that was promised Jannah, be idnillah, that we could do it once a day. So that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds us to account, we've already held ourselves to account. 
of our thoughts, our deeds, and our actions to make sure that when we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've already done the self-reckoning that's necessary. We've done, we've done the self-observation and the work that needs to be done to meet Allah so that he would be pleased with us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and that he would look at us and say, Ya ibaditi idkhuli fi jannati. Oh my servant, look, enter into my Jannah. Jazakumullah al khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sakwa Khan Al Sad Aisha, mashallah tabarakallah. That was such a beautiful reminder. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward you, bless you, increase you in your ilm. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make that a source of a reminder and a source of a way for us to implement, inshallah ta'ala, of the beautiful reminder that you've shared with us. First question that, inshallah, I have is for Ustada Aisha. Ustada Aisha, you did mention Mahasaba, you know, this, this, this way of reflecting on the self. Uh, but one, one question that I did have is sometimes it is very difficult to be alone with yourself. Uh, when I'm alone with myself, I'm very distracted. I can't focus on anything. So what are some of the ways that I can en enhance uh, my mm -hmm. skills in becoming more and more you know, self-accountable? So the first thing is, is do it in stages, right? So the, um, it's really good to keep a journal like for example just sometimes learning to quiet and still the mind as important as it is as we know that in a still reflection you can still you can see yourself more clearly but it's good sometimes to start with um a, like an after fajr journal where you learn to just kind of dump your thoughts right where you just kind of just empty out what's on your mind so that's one thing to help with it the next thing is that start if you if you wanted to do just kind of um small sits which means that you sit for like one minute, three minutes, right? And you choose, you you decide, you can write out, right? Certain things. I want to focus on maybe one sin of mine that I really need to ask Allah for. Uh, I want to focus on one thing I want to really be grateful to Allah for. I want to reflect on one ayah. And only do it starting out between one to three minutes. Right, and then for a few days, let's build to three minutes. That increase it to ten minutes. Then that's one way. That's another way to do it. Lastly, the most important, increase your sujood. Make extend your sujood. If you are when you're making salah, stay a little bit longer in your in your sujood. Get up in qiyamul layl. Those are the best ways, inshallah, to increase your muhasiba. Qiyamul layl, increase your sujood. Have moments of of like you know. Uh, Themes where you sit and ponder on something, and of course, journaling should be consistent. Inshallah. Exactly. So basically, small steps, keep it going, don't give up, you know, keep at it, uh, inshallah, and you will exactly. get there. Exactly. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect you, bless you, your efforts, your families, inshallah, make you a source of much khair um, for all the audiences, inshallah, where we apply what you taught us individually and at the same time take that to our communities and societies to make uh, them better. Uh,